1984's The Return of Godzilla, directed by Koji Hashimoto. After 1975's Terror of Mechagodzilla, Godzilla could finally rest. Though the movies weren't being made anymore, Godzilla left quite an impression on popular culture. Godzilla was a cultural icon and one of Japan's most recognizable exports. You had fun crossover stuff like Bambi meets Godzilla. It doesn't go well for Bambi. Even American comic book publisher Marvel Comics had Godzilla invade their universe, fighting the likes of the Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Steven Spielberg's Jaws, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, was influenced by Godzilla. The music industry would get in on the act as well, with rock band Blue Oyster Cult releasing a song called Godzilla. The scientific community has no shortage of Godzilla fans either, as a dinosaur would be named Gojirasaurus. And a subtle cultural reference I always enjoyed was one of my favorite TV shows, Roseanne, always had a Godzilla toy in the background, which I owned as a kid. In fact, it was in the 1980s that Bandai Japan would acquire the rights to make Godzilla figures, and idiots like me have been blowing money on these things ever since. Other countries tried to replicate Godzilla. You had Denmark's Reptilicus, Britain's Gorgo, South Korea's Yungari, and North Korea's Pulgasari. And of course you had the United States version of Godzilla, Godzilla King of the Monsters. In 1978, a co-production from Toho and Hanna-Barbera Productions would bring us an animated show called Godzilla. Hanna-Barbera was a behemoth of an animation studio, bringing us the likes of Scooby-Doo, the Flintstones, the Jetsons, and countless other classics. Personally, I couldn't stand any of these cartoons, but for some reason they were always on my damn TV. But it seemed like Godzilla was in good hands with Hanna-Barbera, the problem is that American censors allowed very little of what Godzilla actually is to be utilized. It couldn't kill anyone, or even crush buildings, or step on cars. The show also got a lot of things wrong, like Godzilla breathing fire and shooting laser beams from its eyes. Also, Godzuki sucks. The show only lasted two seasons. In 1980, Tomoyuki Tanaka was still waiting for the right opportunity to bring Godzilla back. He commissioned Akira Murao to write up a story titled Resurrection of Godzilla, with Tanaka himself giving input. Tanaka just wanted a Godzilla story on hand that he could put out feelers for to see if there was interest. This new tale in particular included a new monster named Bagan, who was a shape-shifting god monster that took three different forms called the Sacred Monkey Beast, Sacred Water Beast, and Sacred Dragon Beast. In the story, Godzilla would fight and defeat all three forms before going on a rampage itself and becoming the bad guy. This story would introduce the idea of Godzilla absorbing energy from nuclear power plants. However, it would be two years before Tanaka could find the right deal or moment to bring Godzilla back. Which brings us to 1982, where Toho was holding a film festival to celebrate its 50th anniversary. At the festival, Toho would re-release some older Godzilla films, and to their surprise, the films drew big crowds, even against screenings of Disney classics like Bambi and Pinocchio. Akira Ifakube would even create a Godzilla Fantasia filled with all the best Godzilla themes. And as I mentioned in my last video, the Godzilla Resurrection Committee was demanding more Godzilla. Tanaka had seen enough. It was time to bring back his creation. So on December 26, 1983, Toho officially announced Godzilla was coming back. Over the years, Tanaka had regretted the character's change, and he wanted Godzilla to be scary again. He wanted the badass Godzilla of 1954 back. You can think of it sort of like what Batman did in the 1980s, going back to that darker take of a legendary character. The character change was responsible for his decline. It was a mistake. So Tanaka hired Shuichi Nagahara, who wrote The War in Space, to write a screenplay based on Tanaka and Murao's Resurrection of Godzilla story. The screenplay would be titled The Return of Godzilla, and that name would stick. Nagahara would add a fourth form to Bagan, named the Demon Beast form, that would tower over Godzilla. Ultimately, Bagan would be scrapped, however, as the forms would be seen as too costly. Also, Tanaka wanted the emphasis to be on Godzilla, not another monster. Bagan has become sort of a meme, floating in and out of Godzilla projects over the years, but never actually making it into any of the movies. Eventually, it would finally appear in the 1993 Super Nintendo video game, Super Godzilla. In the lead-up to the return of Godzilla, there were plenty of false starts and production ideas involving Toho's monster. 
One idea spawned in the United States in the early 1980s. It was a screenplay called It Ate Cleveland. It was supposed to be a spoof on giant monster movies. However, the people involved in the production tried to use Godzilla without Toho's permission, so they got a quick visit from Toho's lawyers and the movie was canned. And back in Japan, some former Toho employees tried to make their own movie, titled Godzilla vs. the Wolfman. And according to Shizuo Nakajima, most of it got filmed. I think the idea of a giant wolf monster is cool, but this suit looks like Godzilla's fighting the abominable snowman. I mean, that might actually be a good idea. And probably the most serious attempt at resurrecting Godzilla outside of Toho was made by a Hollywood director named Steve Miner, who directed Friday the 13th Part 2 and 3, and also directed episodes of The Wonder Years. Miner had acquired the rights to Godzilla from Toho for a limited time, and he wanted to create a movie called Godzilla King of the Monsters in 3D. He got Fred Decker to write the screenplay. It's a similar story to Gorgo, where a baby Godzilla is found and eventually dies, and then the parent Godzilla sees this and goes on a rampage. There's some James Bond-like spy shit crammed in there to reference the Cold War going on between the US and Soviet Union. They eventually deal with Godzilla by using a new superweapon that's fired into its mouth. They also redesign Godzilla to look more like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Unfortunately for Miner, who poured a lot of work into the project, no studio wanted to deal with the cost, and the project stalled out. With the 3D Godzilla movie not happening, Toho went full steam ahead with the return of Godzilla. Tanaka tried to get Ishiro Honda to direct and Akira Ifakube to write the musical score, but neither were interested. So he hired director Koji Hashimoto. Hashimoto had experience with monster movies as he had worked under Honda multiple times, and Rajiro Kuroku was hired to write the musical score. He was known for his work on television themes and pop songs. So with the return of Godzilla now in production, Toho would spend $1.7 million on promotion, which included merchandise like t-shirts and chewing gum. A telephone number was set up for fans to dial and listen to Godzilla's roar. Teriyoshi Nakano would create what was known as a Godzilla Cybot that was supposed to be used a lot in the film. The 18-foot robotic Godzilla would be a big hit on the promotional tour. However, in the movie, it only appears on close-ups of Godzilla's face. There was an effort to bring back some of the actors from the original Godzilla. One actor that comes to mind is Takashi Shimura. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1982 from emphysema. Another Godzilla original, Akihiko Harata, who played Dr. Serizawa and other characters in Toho films, would help announce the production of The Return of Godzilla at a press conference. Hirata was supposed to be in the film, but tragically he would pass away from lung cancer at the age of 56 before production began. Hirata was one of the three young faces that started it all. These pictures of the original three always make me smile. Hirata, along with Momoku Kochi and Akira Takarada, will always be remembered for helping usher in the longest-running movie series of all time. A movie series that at times can have a pretty confusing continuity. The return of Godzilla's continuity would break from previous movies from the show era. Tanaka decided to completely ignore the sequels to the original, thus cutting out all the movies where Godzilla is a hero. So The Return of Godzilla is actually a direct sequel to Godzilla 1954. The beginning of the movie mimics the original Godzilla, referencing the Lucky Dragon No. 5 incident and having a ship be attacked by Godzilla. The warning of the dangers of nuclear weapons was once again a focal point. There's your typical build-up and an unfortunate scene with giant radioactive sea lice that shouldn't have been in the movie and look silly. But it's worth the wait as Godzilla's return to the big screen after nine years is very dramatic. This shot not only reintroduces Godzilla, but also shows the improvement in Japanese special effects over the last decade. This would be Teriyoshi Nakano's last Godzilla movie, but also his greatest as special effects director. The impressive visuals when Godzilla first encounters the Japanese military is awesome. The way Godzilla looks, roars, and moves is my favorite part of the movie. The roar is deeper and more beastly. Godzilla looks more menacing than ever. The movie had a $6 million budget, which was a lot for that time in Japan, so Nakano would film up to 13 hours of special effects footage. 
Miniatures were built of Shinjuku and the Ginza shopping district for the monster to destroy. This process took eight months and involved 160 employees. The buildings would have less detail than in the original films because of the decision to make Godzilla bigger. The reason Tanaka increased Godzilla from a 50 meter monster to an 80 meter monster was because skyscrapers and buildings had gotten bigger since Godzilla's absence. The miniatures in the original Godzilla films were built at 1 25th the scale, but for the return of Godzilla they'd be built at 1 40th the size. They would try to hide the lack of detail by having the movie take place mostly at night. Nakano made sure to film Godzilla at very low angles, and the sound of Godzilla's footsteps has a healthy boom to them, like in the original. Another cool prop was built to show Godzilla crushing cars and pavement. It was actually a 15 meter Godzilla foot that was operated by Crane. And yet a bad habit of Toho reared its ugly head once again, as they still felt the need to put in stock footage. The footage of the cars blowing up on the highway looks like something from a decade earlier. That's because it was. It was stock footage taken from prophecies of Nostradamus. But overall, this movie gets an A-plus from me in terms of presentation. Godzilla never looked so real and scary before this film. Longtime suit sculptor Nobuyuki Yasumaru created this version of Godzilla. Yasumaro's past work includes Hetero, Gigan, and Gorosaurus. Fans would name this Godzilla suit simply 84 Goji. In an odd twist, the suit would be stolen shortly after filming and was never seen again. Yasumaro brings back some features from the 1954 Godzilla that slowly disappeared over time. He brought back the ears, four toes, and most importantly to me, the fangs. My personal preference has always been that Godzilla looks scarier when it has ears and fangs because it becomes more of a monster or demon rather than just a giant dinosaur. The Asamaro included tubes inside the costume so that the operator could make the eyes, jaw, and upper lip move. The suit was designed specifically for Hiroyoshi Tamawaki, but Tamawaki backed out at the last minute. So the job would go to Kempachiro Satsuma, the man who played Gigan and Hedera. The problem is, is that the suit was built for a much larger man than Satsuma. Satsuma was a strong guy, don't get me wrong, but the suit weighed 242 pounds. That would be tough for anybody to maneuver around in. It was hell to act in it. They would have holes drilled in the fingers of the suit so that Satsuma's sweat could drip out of it. By the end of filming, he would lose 12 pounds. This is eerily similar to what Nakajima dealt with in the original Godzilla 30 years before. This movie borrows elements from Miner and Decker's 3D Godzilla movie that never came out. One example is the U.S.-Soviet tensions. This part of the movie spotlights a unique position for Japan and the Prime Minister who is played by Keiju Kobayashi. An interesting camera angle is used when the Prime Minister must deal with both the US and Soviet diplomats advocating for dropping a nuke on Godzilla. Another idea taken from the 3D movie was having special missiles, in this case it's cadmium missiles, be shot into Godzilla's mouth. The missiles are fired by the Super X, an aerial military vehicle that can withstand Godzilla's attacks and actually knocks the monster out for a while. Unfortunately, a Soviet nuclear missile that was inadvertently fired at Tokyo is shot down in the sky above, which causes a lightning storm to wake Godzilla up. The Super X has no more cadmium, and eventually, from either atomic breath damage or the lightning storm, the Super X gets grounded. Instead of stomping on the Super X, Godzilla drops an entire building down on it, which made me laugh out loud. Two things that bothered me about the return of Godzilla are as follows. The movie has us believe that this is the same Godzilla that attacked Tokyo in 1954. However, that doesn't make sense, because we literally saw that Godzilla die. Its bones disintegrated. That's as dead as you can get. At no point is any explanation given for this, and we're just supposed to accept that this is the same Godzilla. I know it's not a big deal, but it bugged me, especially because it was an easy fix. Just do what Godzilla Raids Again did, and say it's another Godzilla attacking. The other thing I didn't like is that Godzilla is drawn away to his eventual demise using a magnetic transmitter, because in this movie Godzilla navigates using Earth's magnetic field. It just made Godzilla seem simple-minded and way too easy to deal with. But hey, this movie wanted to bring Godzilla back to its 1954 roots, and I believe it accomplished that while at the same time being its own movie. Honda's Godzilla is a force of destruction that sets Tokyo ablaze for almost no reason. 
like a natural disaster. Hashimoto's Godzilla is a terrifying monster that happens to cause destruction as a side effect of its feeding habits. It destroys most of Shinjuku District, but doesn't cause nearly the same amount of destruction and death as the original. I remember being sad as a kid watching Godzilla fall into the volcano with the somber music playing. Turns out it was intentional. As Hashimoto would say, I wanted viewers to feel sorry for Godzilla. The existence of Godzilla itself is a dilemma. Godzilla is a living conflict of evil and sadness. It's interesting how Tanaka at the beginning of the production wanted to bring the evil Godzilla back. But by the end product, we got a Godzilla that you end up feeling sorry for. Godzilla is the son of the atomic bomb. He is a nightmare created out of the darkness of the human soul. He is the sacred beast of the apocalypse. The return of Godzilla would hit Japanese theaters on December 15, 1984. With a budget of $6 million, the movie would make $6.2 million during an eight-week run in theaters. Unfortunately, even in its native country, Japanese movies had a B-movie perception. American movies had flooded the market and became the dominant force in Japan. But Godzilla did okay, considering it was competing against Ghostbusters and Gremlins. Combine this with the millions of dollars it made in merchandise sales connected to the film, and a sequel was virtually guaranteed. Tanaka had succeeded. Godzilla was back. The United States would get this movie a year later when American distribution company New World Pictures would buy the rights to the return of Godzilla for $500,000. It would be heavily Americanized, so just like Godzilla 1954 had its Americanized counterpart Godzilla King of the Monsters, the return of Godzilla had Godzilla 1985. In King of the Monsters, extra scenes were shot and added to the film. Famous Hollywood actor Raymond Burr, later known for his role as Perry Mason, played reporter Steve Martin, who is made to appear like he's in Tokyo while Godzilla is attacking. This is Perry Mason, and he's in Japan, he's in Tokyo, and Godzilla is destroying the city. It was only afterwards that I learned that in the Japanese version, you're not even in the movie. <laughs> Nor in Japan. Uh, to, down here in one little studio on, on Western Avenue. The smallest studio in this town. And uh, we shot all of that movie, everything that I was in in that movie, in uh, a 24-hour period. In some scenes, it's even made to look like he's in the room with the Japanese characters. In retrospect, some have mocked the ham-handed way of inserting an American into an already-made movie. So surely you'd think nobody would try that again. Well, 30 years later, Raymond Burr would once again be contacted to reprise his role as Steve Martin. This time, the character is just called Mr. Martin, as the comedian Steve Martin had become popular in the 30 years since the original movie. Originally, American producers wanted Godzilla 1985 to be played off as a spoof. Before hiring Burr, they considered hiring Leslie Nielsen. But once Burr was hired and on set, he made it clear that he took the allegory of Godzilla seriously and if it turned into a comedy, he would have no part. Godzilla is a symbol of the nuclear menace threatening mankind. All Burr's scenes are shot from what's supposed to be the Pentagon, so he isn't even in Japan this time. Burr's presence shifted the entire tone of the film. Instead of a humorous film, the movie now kept the grave nature that the Japanese film intended. Everybody thought I was out of my mind, but it wasn't the large sum of money. It was the fact that, first of all, I kind of liked Godzilla. And where do you get the opportunity to play yourself 30 years later? Conveniently, at the same time, Raymond Burr was also asked to reprise his role as Perry Mason in a made-for-TV movie called The Return of Perry Mason. So all the press coverage for that led to some free publicity for Godzilla 1985. American soda company Dr. Pepper would finance the extra scenes, which of course meant there would be product placement. The soda company wanted Burr to drink a can of Dr. Pepper in one scene, so the American director, R.J. Kaiser, asked Burr to do it. I had asked Burr about that, and he fixed me one of those withering glares and just said nothing. So it's safe to say Kaiser wasn't going to ask him again, and when the Dr. Pepper people insisted, Kaiser told them to contact Burr themselves. They didn't have the balls to do it, so it was dropped. Instead, a random Pentagon official takes a sip. There are a lot of edits and differences between the two films, but I'll just mention the ones that I found interesting. New World made it clear to edit out all footage that looked cheap, such as bad miniatures. They also wanted to have Godzilla arrive earlier in the movie and make the runtime shorter. 
The most controversial edits are in regards to the U.S.-Soviet storyline. They didn't like Hashimoto making the U.S. and Soviet Union appear to be moral equals with Japan stuck in the middle. So New World edits the film to make it look like the Soviets were purposely firing an atomic weapon at Japan, rather than it just being an accident like in the original. Two good things from the American version are as follows. They at least try to address the fact that Godzilla being alive makes no sense. Mr. Martin says in one scene that no body was ever discovered. They never found any corpse. But that's still obviously not good enough. And yes, I'm aware this is not the same Godzilla from 1954. That's not the point. The point is, is that this individual movie just does a terrible job making that clear. I don't care about supplemental material at the time or future films retconning. This movie just doesn't do a good job explaining that. In 1954, Steve Martin acted as sort of a narrator, but he doesn't seem to have a purpose in this one. However, his presence pays off as he provides the only moment that makes the American version worth watching. Mr. Martin's speech when Godzilla falls into the volcano with the music playing is immensely more moving than the original film's ending. The reckless ambitions of man are often dwarfed by their dangerous consequences. For now, Godzilla, that strangely innocent and tragic monster, has gone to Earth. Whether he returns or not, or is never again seen by human eyes, the things he has taught us remain. Interestingly, Burr wrote the speech himself. To see Godzilla be taken so seriously gives the character so much more importance than the general public usually gives it, and knowing Raymond Burr meant every word makes it even more special. Despite the publicity, American audiences didn't seem to care much for Godzilla with a mediocre box office result. Godzilla 1985 opened in American theaters on August 23, 1985, but didn't do too well as it was competing with Back to the Future, Rambo, and The Goonies. Regardless of the bad showing in the United States, the Heisei era of Godzilla had begun in Japan. A sequel was in the works, but it would take a few years to get there. Next up is 1989's Godzilla vs. Biollante.